gonna get loud. Behind me is my half barrel system. Um, typically, uh, I brew 10 gallon batches in it. My system has a hot liquor tank, a mash tank that has a false bottom. Once the mash is complete, it goes into the boil kettle for our boil. After the boil, it will be chilled and in, into the fermenter it goes, at which point it will be inoculated with yeast for fermentation. Today, we're going to be brewing an amber ale, so let's get started. First, we need to measure up all of our grains. We'll use 15 and a half pounds of two row brewer's malt. I'll add our pound each of our specialty malts. Crystal 80 malt will give us the color. It will also give us the dextrin for the non fermentables. It will also add in mouthfeel of our beer. We'll also be adding a pound of victory malt, which will give a nice biscuity flavor to the malt profile. And we'll also be adding a pound of melanoidin malt, which will increase the maltiness, as well as provide a nice deep, rich red color to our beer. From here, we will grind our grain and I like to grind my grain to the point where it just becomes a flour. Um, if you over mill it, what can happen is you can get a stuck mash. If you under mill it, then you may not get the extract potential that you want. grind mine a little finer. Um, the false bottom I have will allow me to separate most of this flour material out. So at this point we have to wait for our mash tongue to reach its strike temperature. This particular recipe we're shooting for a mash temperature of 156 degrees. I got started in home brewing when I was in college. I went to school at Michigan Tech and it was really nice nice uh, um, restaurant up in Houghton that served Bell's Porter on tap. And I had that and I thought, man, this is good. So I started shopping around for other craft brews and uh, um, that just developed my flavor for, for wanting something different, something unique. What keeps me going with home brewing is the science and the creativity. Being a chemistry student while I was in college, I thought, what better way to enjoy craft beer than to try to do it myself and, and marry the science with the art. So once I started doing that, um, I just kept experimenting, trying different styles, and that just kept me going. Once all the dough balls are broken up, um, I will stir this maybe once every 15 minutes or so. Um, usually, just let the water do its work. What I'm doing now is heating up my sparge water. The sparge water will rinse the grain after I, after I remove all the wort from the mash time into the boil kettle. All the grain are going to hold in a lot of sugars. So what we need to do is rinse those sugars off. We do that by sparging. And what that will do is, like I said, it rinses the grain. We'll get more extract efficiency because we are bringing all, all the uh, sugars over. And, it, and that will give us our terminal volume in our oil pot, which is probably about uh, close to 12 gallons is what I'm shooting for. And after the boil, we should have about 10, 10 and a half gallons left. I'm using a pump, uh, well, for two reasons. One, so I can recirculate my work. And two, because I have a two-tier system. The mash and my hot liquor tank are on the same level. So I have to get liquid from my hot liquor tank into the mash somehow, so I need a pump. 
They'll turn the valve on to the mash tank, and the pump is not on. I'm going to open this valve. It's going to bleed out all the air that's inside. You'll see it coming down. And there's my mash. Now what I will do is I will eventually I'll put this back into the mash kettle. I'm going to turn on the mash, or excuse me, turn on my pump, and start pumping it through. There it goes. Now I'll do this for approximately 15 minutes or so, and by that time the work should be clear. My favorite thing about home brewing is being able to share the hobby with others. I like to, to uh, talk about experiences, different techniques. I like to learn different things. I've been brewing for quite a while, but I'm still learning. Everybody learns in the hobby. It's, it's like science. It's, you never know it all. After we're done recirculating, it, it becomes a little clearer. You will see that it's still a little, it's, it is still a little turbid. Um, what these are, it's, uh, it's coming from grain proteins. What's going to happen is during the boil, these proteins are going to agglomerate. They're going to form much larger particles. You will add a clarifying agent called Irish moss. It's a seaweed. Uh, what that does is it, it will crash out all the agglomerated um, uh, proteins. Thus, we'll, we will uh, have a much clearer beer in, uh, in the long run. But as you can see, all the main particles are out. All the sediment, or all the sediment is out of it. Um, at this point, we can now begin emptying our, our work into our bowl. So from here, I'm going to open up the valve and let her drain. The type of uh, of, of, of sparge I'm going to do is called batch sparging. What a batch sparge is, is what we're going to do, we're going to add all of our sparge water to the mash tun. Without sprinkling it in, we're just going to pour it all in. We're going to mix it up, recirculate it again until it becomes somewhat clear, and then that goes into our boil pot. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pump in my hot sparge water. The sparge water is probably at 170 100 to 180 degrees F right now. And what we'll do is I'm just going to pump it straight into my mash kettle and uh, stir it up so we can rinse the grains. My favorite beer that I have brewed would have to be a clone of the Dragon's Milk from New Holland Brewery in Holland, Michigan. That particular beer allowed me to use several different techniques that I never used before. It was the first time that I used bourbon infused oak to age a beer on. And it's also the first time that I, I attempted a party guile where I would make a very high gravity beer and then use second runnings from that mash to make a much lower gravity beer. So I had 10 gallons of beer from the same mash, but I had two distinctly different beers. I would have to say that so far that's been my favorite experience. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to recirculate that. It'll help, it'll help to rinse the grain and also to reset my grain bed so it can act as a filter base. As the, the uh, um, gravity or the sugar content in your mash begins to decrease because of the amount of, of water you're putting in, it dilutes down the sugar, what that does is it will also change your mash pH. If your mash, mash pH gets much above 5.8, 5.9 into 6, it will begin to extract some tannin compounds from your grain husk. And what that will do is it will, it will, it will actually add some, a, a little bit of astringency to your final product. If you're looking for a very clean beer, then I suggest you want to keep that pH in check. And back sparging is an excellent way to do that on the home brew scale. So now I'm going to drain this into our boil pot. And that will complete the volume necessary for this, for this particular batch. To ask a brewer what their secret recipe is or their favorite recipe is, is like asking a parent, who is their favorite child. However, that said, I will say this. I always have staples on tap at my house, being an English ale, an amber ale, or my or a uh, rye pale ale. Now all of these spar or excuse me, all of the uh, water that we need, wort rather, is in the boil pot. Um, this is after the sparge. And I have approximately 12 gallons, 11 and a half to 12 gallons of wort in my boil kettle um, during boil. A lot's going to evaporate, and I'll be left with approximately 10 gallons, which is the volume that I'm going to shoot. The bearing hops will go in at the 60 minute mark, meaning that I'm going to boil this for 60 minutes. If the 60 minute mark is over, the oil will be cut off, and I'll begin chilling the work. I love using Magnum hops for my uh, uh, upfront bearing hops. Magnum is a very clean flavor to it, but it's very high in IV use. So I don't have to use very many hops. But uh, what I'm going to do is this particular formula will have, I uh, believe, one and a half ounces of magnum hops. So I'm going to weigh that out while I'm waiting for this to
to approach boil, as you can see, the foam is growing. Let's get to the point where it's close to the top of my kettle. Break it down with some spray. I'm also going to cut down the amount of heat. By doing this, I'm breaking up the foam, cuts it down, preventing my boil over. I'll keep an eye on it until we get a nice rolling boil without the foam growing. As you can see, the foam is still growing. Have you ever thought about going pro? Sure I have. Um, I think that's an aspiration of almost any home brewer. But I, I prefer to keep this as my own personal hobby. I reduce the heat a little bit more, but yet we still have a nice, gentle rolling boil. And now the hops are going to go in. These are the magnums. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my spoon. I'm going to help them become incorporated. And at this point, you should smell the beautiful aroma that the hops have to offer. And this is the point where I will start my 60 minute boil. Enjoy the aromas. Typically when I brew, I like a very clean, crisp ale. To do so, I like to ferment at, at lower temperatures. It gives me a nice, cleaner profile. It also depends on the season. In the spring, in the summertime, I particularly like the English styles or the ambers. Um, sometimes I'll, um, I'll like an IPA. In the wintertime, I like something a little stronger. So that's when I will start experimenting with old ales or stouts or imperial stouts. Something that has a little bit more body, things that are a little bit more unique. And every once in a while, I'll throw in a Belgian ale. I do like the Belgian ales. Uh, throughout the year, I always have an example on tap somewhere. All right, we're approaching our, our 10 minute mark. I'm gonna put in our last addition of hops, two ounces of Mount Hood, going in. I'll take my spoon. We incorporate them in and let it go. You can really smell them. You can smell the aroma pop out. All right, our hour mix timer is up. I'm going to kill the heat and then we're going to begin chilling. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the water on, everything's sterilized. I'm going to be using an inline uh, a heat exchanger, it's also called a plate chiller. So hot wort's going to go in, and cold wort will come out. So hook it to the water supply, and I'll begin pumping. Let's start. I want to get it as cool as I can. The ale and yeast are capable of fermenting upper 70s to give a nice estery, flowery profile. The benefits of fermenting ales at a cooler temperature is it keeps a lot of the flowery notes and the ester notes down to a minimum. This way you, you can get a crisper, cleaner profile to your beer. And that's the type of ales that I particularly like to have. So I'm gonna chill this down to about 66, 64 degrees, and it will ferment at about 64 to 66 degrees in my basement. Um, I'll leave it ferment there for about uh, at least 12 days, 12 to 14 days, and from there, then it will go into my cabin. The advice for homebrewers I, I would have is to don't be intimidated, don't be, don't be apprehensive. It's not as hard as you would think. Um, there, there's an enormous amount of information on the internet, you can talk to friends, and, I'm, and I will stress the power of the club, as a good friend of mine puts it. Um, find a homebrewing club, go and visit the homebrewing club. You get to make contacts, you get to network, you get to um, experience other techniques. Um, you also get to share each other's brew, or brew. And say if you have a member that comes up and say, there's something wrong with my beer, tell me what's wrong with it. Then everybody gets to learn from that one experience. So, uh, this is a batch of Y-East 1450. It's also called Denny's Favorite 50. This type of yeast will give a heartier beer a beer with a little bit more mouthfeel, a little bit more dextrins, but also bring some hop flavors out. So hopefully the, the use of this yeast will help accentuate the Mount Hood hops that I used at the, uh, at the 10 minute mark. Um, so all I'm going to do, 
nice and simple, you just go straight in. And from this point, what we will do, we'll cap it up, and we're going to move it into an environment that is around 64 to 66 degrees, and we're going to let it ferment for 12 to 14 days before we uh, take it off. For any existing home brewer or up and coming home brewer, be yourself. Brew what you want to brew. Don't be pressured to make double IPAs or something that you just really don't like. And that is what this, this episode has been all about. I do like double IPAs.